Renee, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, you flew in this morning, so I just want to give you extra kudos <laughs> for that, right? Like, no, definitely. It actually worked out, though, because Shakari Richardson was running at, like, 4 a.m., and my flight was I saw you tweeting about yeah. it. <laughs> I was like, listen, I'm up, so. But this is dope. This is my first time in the Hamptons. Well, welcome. Thank you. I hope you can stay a little bit and enjoy. This is our last nice. panel, we promise. So, like, you know, summer camp starts after this, summer Friday. <laughs> um, so, okay. So I want to start with your incredible story um, going from being, you know, a WNBA star to, I believe, the first former player WNBA co-owner. Um, and I also an know that. An exec. And there's a documentary about this coming out. Yes. 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 So tell us your origin, you know, tell us the story and, and maybe also give us, you know, it's a little preview for the doc, right? Right. Yeah. So I'll start with the doc. So... The story kind of happened in 2020 when everybody knows everything shut down. A lot of athletes, like myself, we decided that we were going to opt out. So during that time, the NBA was figuring things out. The WNBA was figuring things out. Um, but there was this guy, I don't know if people know him, LeBron James. <laughs> Who? Le yeah, right? Like, so LeBron saw... Wait, was he the guy holding the, the flag? Yeah, the, Captain, okay, Captain James for Team America right now. But yeah, so he saw that, you know, we were trying to do some things, and he had tweeted out that he wanted to buy the dream. So I saw that, and I'm like, what in the world? LeBron James? And so I hit up his team, and long story short, Spring Hill, which is his production company, came on and wanted to follow the journey, follow the story. He's an executive producer on, on the documentary. Mav Carter is an executive producer on the documentary. Um, the director is Sandrine. It ended up being more so about like things, the choices you make in life. You know, like me mm. opting out, I didn't know where that choice was gonna take me. Basically, you're opting out of your job and you don't have another job. And it's a pandemic where there aren't a lot of jobs around to get. But those kind of choices is what led me to be, to your point, the first WNBA player turned owner exec. So the whole documentary is kind of like choices in my life that I made that were kind of unorthodox at the time, but ended up being something different when you fill it out. Can you maybe walk us through... I don't know if it was a moment or, you know, a period of time. Obviously, we'll watch the doc to learn more. But um, sort of how you made the decisions that led you to this role. Yeah, I mean, this specific de decision, you know that saying, there's always these sayings like fortune favors the bold, a leap of faith, and all of those things. I mean, I think you do have to have a certain level of, like, I'm about to do it and whatever happens, happens. You know, because we can make a gazillion plans. I couldn't have planned for this to happen. You know, like even if I set out to say I was gonna opt out and I, I didn't plan on retiring. You know, I thought I was gonna opt out in 2020. I thought I was gonna get right back to it in 2021. Mm. Life didn't have that happen, out for, happen for me. So I think that it was really just, I saw, so Larry Gosteiner is the majority owner of the Atlanta Dream. And he is billionaire real estate, all of the things. And he taught me something that I didn't know. He said that your gut is actually a reason. You know, like when you're making decisions, we almost have to tell ourselves like, well, what's my reason for this decision? You're weighing your pros, you're weighing your cons, and you're um, almost looking at the list. And we almost ignore what our gut tells us or that intuition that we have. Ever since I've been a part of the ownership group with Larry, he's re-emphasized to me multiple times that your gut is a reason to make a decision. And so to answer your question on what was my reasoning, it was literally a gut decision that I felt like I need to be here in Atlanta right now with the city, with everything going on, because uh, nothing about that decision made sense if we're being honest. I've worked my whole life to get to the WNBA. You know, like I started playing little. Like if, when you see the documentary, you'll see little bitty me always trying to get to the WNBA only to opt out. It really does, it's not logical, but that's the thing about decisions. I'm sure there's all these business people in here. If you've made big business, you've made a big decision, like because it's not gonna just fall in your lap, anything big. So that's kind of what it was. I just started to trust my gut more. And I, I think what, it, what else is something that you have learned, um, I think since you became a co-owner, that, you know, about the business side of 
the WNBA that maybe surprised you or that you know you weren't exposed to a, as you know a player coming up? Whew, yeah, I mean, as a player, I was probably mad at the wrong people. <laughs> I don't know, like <laughs> when you want things to be better, you automatically just look at your team and like, why aren't they treating us better? Why don't we have this? Why don't we have that? But then when you become an owner and you start to see the business side of it and you start to understand, well, no, you can't give players anything over this amount. No, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. Because as an ownership group, all three of us, me, Larry, and Suzanne, we wanted to come in and we wanted to just shake some stuff up. Like we were like, we're changing everything. And then we started to realize, oh, we can't change that. Oh, this is a part of the seat. Oh, we can't do, and it just started to, we started to be like, me as a player, I was like, wow, so. Can you give an example maybe of something you wanted to change that you couldn't? I mean, gifting. You know, like we wanted to gift our players with equipment that would help them be the best of them. I know everybody, like we'll use LeBron, continue to use him as an example. We, I'm sure everybody's heard that he spends like a million dollars a year on his body. I heard it's actually more than that at this point, but he spends $1 million making sure that he can be the best athlete that he can be. Well, what if people can't necessarily afford to invest in that for themselves, or what if they don't have those types of things? Well, we wanted to supply them with certain things that would help them just in their journey as an athlete, but there's a limit on the amount that you can gift. So that to me was like, wow, I thought that if this is a sports thing, you should probably be able to do it. But, you know, I understand why also, but those are just the types of things like the mats like that vibrate and help you, you know, that you can sleep on. Those types of things are expensive. So we wanted to be able to supply it to our, our athletes. But, you know, there's limits. And when athletes come to you, you know, now you're on the other side. I know, right? right? It's crazy. <laughs> So how do you navigate those conversations with players when they come to you with probably some of the same questions or concerns or complaints that you had? Um, I'm sure you're, you were in their shoes, so that helps. But sort of how do you navigate those conversations? And are you like the go-to person on the ownership group that the players sort of come to? or? Um, I definitely, well, here's the crazy part that you don't really see. Like my scenario that happens in sports you really don't see it very often. Um, very rarely, like right now, we'll see a lot of players that own ownership stake in other teams, but it might be a WNBA player with a soccer team. LeBron owns a piece of a soccer team. We see Serena Williams in soccer and different things of that nature, but you don't as often see a player, like I said, I went straight from player straight to owner exec. I played with two players that are on my team currently. So it's kind of, it's a different scenario. Like Tina Charles, I played with her in college at UConn. Like she was my young pup coming up. And then I played with her in the WNBA and I played with her her MVP season. And now she's a player on my team. So just to give you the dynamics of sometimes you can't go to like, I still don't even know how it works. So if somebody's in the crowd that knows like, Am I allowed to go to dinner with TT? Like, I don't know how that works. Does anyone it's, know the answer to that question? Like, am I allowed to go to dinner with other players that I played with that are my homies, but, or is that tampering now? Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's, there's a lot of fine lines that you don't really see very often because if I owned a soccer team, I could chill and hang with everybody. You know what I mean? It's not a big deal, but the fact that I'm a former WNBA player with a lot of players that are still active, a lot of my teammates that are still active in the game, they're dapping me up at jump ball. You know, I'm talking to people after the game and then sometimes afterwards I'm like, I hope I don't get in trouble for that. Like, you know, cause they're my homies, but everything changed when the title changed. Right, right. And it's probably a pretty unique dynamic, right? Especially compared to some of the other owners, you know, with those relationships. Um, let's talk about the growth of the WNBA. Okay. The story everyone wants to talk about. Um, by pretty much every measurable metric, right? Uh, I want to talk about the media deal that uh, the league just signed, uh, I believe, 11 years, $2.2 billion. Um, I'm curious if you have an opinion on... <laughs> I'm um, going to ask your opinions on a few <laughs> things, if you don't mind. All right, but let's the, do it. But first of all, uh, there's... Because there's conversations about this in the college space for, for the women's basketball tournament media deal, too. What what's your opinion on the NBA and the WNBA selling their rights together? Because I think that that's a really big and interesting conversation about packaging men's and women's sports together versus pulling them apart. Uh, we're seeing some different 
examples of that in different sports, but sort of, I don't know, what, what's your initial reaction? Ooh, this is a journalism question I'm right sorry. here. Um, I'm no, trying to get a couple of quotes. No, know? but it's great. Uh, that's the thing about the game growing. I think we do have to be out here and, and talk about it. So for me, I was with the WNBA since 2009. When I came in from college, we had just, I'm coming off of a high. I mean, we went undefeated at UConn. I'm used to flying private to every mm -hmm. game. I'm used to a certain, certain lifestyle. Yeah, I'm used to a certain lifestyle. And then when you come to the WNBA, that lifestyle does shift. And so to me, I understood in the beginning that you need, we, like that was our big brothers. You know, they still are our big brothers. You need that help. I also think that there is gonna become a point in time where I think the WNBA can and should be able to stand on its own, just in a certain sense of, if the growth continues to grow how it is, I know that even with our ownership group, we're excited about where it's heading and we're excited to invest in where it's heading and to invest in having more ownership in the WNBA as far as owners are concerned. And so I, I think that that's gonna be tricky, you know, because the NBA has been our big brother since the beginning of time. Um, but, you know, sometimes you gotta grow up. And so the WNBA, we are still a very young league, I think 28 years old. So mm -hmm. that's a very young league. And I do hope one day that we'll be able to stand on our own two feet. I'm trying to decide if I want to put you on the spot again, <laughs> but maybe. Because you guys might not know, but this is like me as an owner talking about this is a little bit yeah. of a tricky situation. Yeah. Um, but so I'll, like I'll, give you, I'll give you a softball. I'll give you. I'll, you can I'll, give me a medium ball. Well, I'll give you an opportunity to clap back at, at me. Okay. <laughs> okay. So with all the growth, right, there are, still, there are so many narratives about the league. And with new fans coming in, there's obviously been so much, especially like on Twitter, so much X Twitter, so much conversation <laughs> about you know new fans coming in yeah. and the sort of like misunderstanding, misconceptions. What is maybe the most frustrating narrative that you see about the WNBA that you're working to change? And then I'll let you hit back at me in a second. <laughs> I like this. I like question. this. No, um, I think. There is a lot of opinion on that. Um, I'm happy for the growth. I'm like, listen, I'm glad you made it. You know, uh, I would think the most frustrating thing I think for me is I just want people to know the people, the women that laid the ground foundation, even for me myself. Like, <clears throat> I love that you, if you just started joining today, this year, because you love a college player and you're here now, great. And I can't wait till you find out about Cheryl Swoops. And I can't wait till you find out about Cynthia Cooper and Maya Moore, you know, like that. So for me, I think that that's just the growth of the game where when people start to get exposed more, like I was on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, but I'm going to call it Twitter. So when I was on Twitter, I saw a lot of people getting exposed to Arike Agumbawale and how she plays. And I heard the saying like, man, she ball like a dude, what? And that to me is shock of shocks. <laughs> no, wow. and, and I'm hype about that though, because it's like, yeah, try to tell y'all. Like, you know, it's like, so for me, it's like, I can't wait till people get exposed to more players. Cause I think people are genuinely shocked by how good the WNBA players are. I think that because you never watched it before on a regular basis, you might think that the style of play is not where it's at. So for me, I always say the product has always been A1. I think that we need more exposure. I think that we need more media games on TV, national TV, so people can just turn on and watch it. We need more sponsors, ads, but the product's always been A1. So I wouldn't say it's frustrating. It's just I always get excited when people see something and then they're like, oh, wow, and they think it's the first time. And then when they find out it's happened like five other times, it's like, start doing your work. Like, I'm a women's basketball historian at this point at my young, tender age because, <laughs> because it's, I've seen it all. I watched it since I was little. I know when it started in 96 and I've watched the game since. So hit back at me, right? Um, what can the journalists who are covering the league do better? Oh, I like this question. Yes. Yes. Do so your research. I mean, no, I'm honestly going to say just do your research. I mean, we recently just had something happen at the Olympics where a large amount of humans did not do research. Everybody saw. Yes. You did, I'm sure you guys can understand what I'm saying. There was a narrative that was being pushed about a woman and they thought something. But this large amount of humans did not do research. I think that it's easy to be the first. A lot of people want to be the first to the story, break the story, send a tweet. I heard something. Let me tweet it out. 
I think as journalists, there needs to be a little bit more responsibility to do your research before following a narrative and making sure you're fact checking something before following a narrative of what someone just said. I think if you're a journalist, because a lot of times people are just on the internet, so I'm speaking strictly to journalists. Mm -hmm. If you consider yourself a journalist and you practice journalism, I think that you owe it to that craft to do your research. Absolutely. Um, so we have a couple more minutes, I believe. Um, Stay with us, y'all. I know it's hot out here. Stay with us. I know, we're schwitzing, but like also we're going to have lunch. It's, like I said, <laughs> it's, it's a summer Friday. A couple more questions. Um, what is on your to-do list at the Dream? For, I don't know, I mean, we're obviously in the middle of the season now, but like, what, what are the top three things on your to-do list? Win some games, man. I know it's like, <laughs> come on. I mean, it's hard for me, too, because I'm not like... You could coach, maybe. Yeah, well, I don't have the patience to coach, so Fair. that's why I, I know myself. I. And it's hard for me because I'm an athlete that's been there, so it's like when we lose, I really lose. Like, it's like I lose like I'm an athlete on the team lose, so I'm... Right now, we're on a nine-game losing streak, so that was the first thing that popped in my head. Like, we need to win a game when we come back. So, first and foremost... We need to win, but we're, we've been unhealthy all season. So I know y'all know how sports goes. This is everybody's story, but, you know, we've missed two to three starters for more than half of the season already. So get healthy is one of the things. Um, secondly is just, I would say keep that same energy. You know, we've so, we sold out every single game to date right now this season. I would love if we sold out a full season of our games. Like, that is starting to set the tempo for Atlanta's here for us. You know, like, I, when I played for the Atlanta Dream – we would run out and we would have to be our own energy because it would be not even as many people in this building as it is well, outside, but we would have such a low fan base that as a player, it's hard. Like they call it the six man for a reason. Sometimes you don't have it or sometimes you need the crowd to be that pick me up. I wanna keep that same energy and always have a sold out crowd to be that pick me up for our team. And then lastly, um, we, need, uh, we need some more deals. You know, like shouts to Delta and I'm, I hope Delta sees this too. Delta is our home airline and they just did a big deal with the WNBA. So I hit up my guy Chase and I'm like, Chase, what's up now? Where's our team level Are deal? Like, and so that's, yeah. So that's just the next step is we got real companies now that are coming in, pitching us, trying to holler at us. So the next step is how do we take the business to the next level? Places it's never been before, honestly. And to your point of the growth of the WNBA, the growth of the WNBA trickles down to each individual team. I mean, we, we sold out State Farm Arena and had an attendance bigger than any Hawks game has ever had. That's a wild thing to think about. Yeah. yeah and we're doing it again. So it's like in that growth, we need to continue to keep the pedal to the metal. So a lot of more of the same. I mean, Atlanta is one of these cities that once they start getting behind you, they, they stand behind you. So that's kind of where we want to keep going with it. Awesome. All right, last question. Let's go. Just just a funny one, because you mentioned the Olympics uh -huh. um, and Shikari Richardson. Let's what, go! What is your favorite sport to watch and you are not allowed outside of basketball Ooh. and three-on-three? Three. Where's Brandon anything. at? Oh, Brandon, okay, because I thought that I was just talking to Brandon. I w bas basketball wouldn't even be my number Ooh. one. Yeah, I know. It's crazy, right? Basketball is not my favorite Olympic sport. It is by far, hands down, track and field. And more specific, same. Look, oh, we're clapping for that. Y'all ain't clapping for nothing else all day. And it's like, we're clapping for track and field. No, I love it. Um, but track and field, I just, because the athlete in me and how I think. So for me, I play basketball. We train all the time. I could have a bad first quarter. And then I'm like, you know what? My bad, y'all. I'm going to make sure I have a good second quarter. I'm going to make sure I finish the game strong. And track and field, and particularly sprints, they got 10 seconds. They train for... Four years, by the way, because there's not a lot of track and field events that right. happen throughout the year. Think about training for four years for 10 seconds. Like, it's like, think about the level of discipline you have to have to know that the Olympics is basically your Super Bowl. And you could false start. You could catch a cramp. You could get hurt. And you train for four years for that 10 seconds. So I just love everything about the concept of training with track, but then I just love also watching them. And Shakari, I'm, I'm standing out for her. I can't believe she didn't get to perform last Olympics, by the I way. Know. So coming back this Olympics, like she said, I'm not back, I'm better. But I'm just like, the mentality of a track athlete, they gotta be built 
different. And then it's just fun to watch. But yeah, they're built different. I actually have a scar from running high school track. Okay, what'd you run? The 800. Okay. Right? So I'm kind of a masochist. Anyway, <laughs> and we're going to end on that note. Thank you so much, Renee. Appreciate y'all. Appreciate y'all. We're huddling in the Hamptons, yes. baby.